Great. Uh, welcome, everybody. And uh, I, I just want to thank Volvo for, for being a part of our uh, program and helping to support us and ASICS as well. Um, we are uh, going to discuss hydration this evening, but before we jump into that, I just want to let you all know an announcement that came from the LA Marathon office that I myself just heard today late this afternoon, and that's that the um, finish line is being moved. It's not being moved very far, but basically what's going on is there's a lot of construction going on, I gather, on Avenue of the Stars where the finish line was. So unless people want to fall into a, you know, what is it, a 50-foot ditch, um, which would be really bad for the race, um, instead of taking a right turn to that unseen finish line, which was we've done in the, the last two LA marathons, um, I believe that's correct, last two LA marathons, you're going to go straight, like the same distance you would have turned right and gone to the finish line. You'll just continue straight and the finish line, you'll actually see it, you know, from a mile away or whatever, You'll see it as you approach it. It won't be around the corner anymore. It'll be right in front of you. Wh whatever it was, whatever the distance was up Avenue of the Stars, it'll be the same exact distance in front of you. Like, what is that, 50 meters, 75 meters, just down Santa Monica Boulevard going east, right? So it'll still be kind of like below the people running west at Mile 18. So, so it can kind of be like below across the island, the barrier. All that is still exactly the same. It's just we're finishing on Santa Monica Boulevard, not Avenue of the Stars. So uh, let's knock that one out. And let's get the party started with our lecture on hydration this evening. So thank you guys for coming. I always love this quote. If you have a body, you are an athlete. That means all of you. Um, Bill Barman, who was uh, the inventor of the Nike shoe and also was at the University of Oregon for many, many years as their head coach, a, a renowned coach in the United States. Um, this is just me. Um, there you go. And the book that I co-wrote. And here we go. Okay. Tonight's chat, just to reiterate, by the way, all of these chats are being, like I said, recorded. And the recordings are on our YouTube channel. And I always, every week, week, post the link to our YouTube channel on our Facebook site. That's LA Roadrunners dash group page is the name of our Facebook site. So you can get the link there or you can just go on YouTube and search for LA Roadrunners. You'll probably find like six different channels. Ours is the little dark blue circle with the newest LA Roadrunner logo on it, similar to the one I'm wearing right now. At any rate, um, that's our YouTube current channel. You'll find all sorts of YouTube videos from the whole season, including some upcoming videos that have already been finished on the LA Marathon and how to pace the LA Marathon. We have three videos on how to pace the LA Marathon already up online. They're each about 20 something minutes. So you're talking about about an almost an hour of how to pace the LA Marathon. The first 23 minutes alone is on just the first six miles, which I view as so critical to this race. Um, we are doing the first six miles of the LA Marathon right after our next two build weeks. Uh, excuse me, this Saturday and the Saturday after that are both build weeks, 19 mile, 20 mile. Those, that's the end of our build weeks. That's it. Next week is the last build week for the LA Marathon. Then we taper and it's that first, that next Saturday that we're going to be at Dodger Stadium running the first six miles of the LA Marathon and then four miles beyond that. But the six miles will be on the course at race pace and that's um, what we're going to be doing three Saturdays from now. March the 4th, mark your calendar, same time, 7 o'clock, Dodger Stadium, March the 4th, Saturday. Um, so that'll be two weeks before the LA Marathon, which is on Sunday. We're going to be there on Saturday, March the 4th. So um, in previous chat, the last one we talked about 
calculate your carbohydrate intake before the marathon. So you know how many grams of carbohydrate you need per hour of the LA Marathon. And what you're really shooting for is about 40 to 60 grams per carbohydrate per hour. Um, and that is really critical for your race. If you're not taking in like 40 to 60, unless you're really a, a petite probably a petite woman or a very big guy. Um, muscles don't matter. Um, it's just about weight. Uh, if you're if you're a smaller person or a bigger person, it may be a little more, or excuse me, it may be a little less than 40. It might be as much as 66 grams. Most people cannot really absorb more than 66 grams per, per hour, per hour because um, you start getting nauseous. Figure 40 to 60 grams per hour um, and figure out the calculation. If you want our last video, um, again, you can go scroll down the, the, the Facebook channel and find the link or just go directly to our YouTube channel to find that whole video. And that was pretty extensive on that topic. So um, we have one more build week. That is true. And then three weeks of taper. The The build, final build week starts Monday. So we still have Saturday and Sunday as well. Our build, you know, tomorrow, Saturday and Sunday are still build part of this week. Um, so the question is, is how much hydration do you want to calculate similar to grams of carbohydrate per hour? How much hydration liquid do you need to take in per hour? And so let's discuss that right now. It's not a big lecture. It's really a short one, honestly. Um, so let's move that out of the way. Good. So you need about, now this is a very broad idea, but you need about four to eight ounces of liquid every 15 minutes. Now that could come in the form of electrolyte, which is the drink that's gonna be on the, the course that we've had at the end of our last couple of runs. Uh, runs, run walks, walks, whatever you're doing, you've probably had a bottle, there were those little bottles of electrolyte that will be poured on the course. We are not having Gatorade, we're not having a new one, we are having electrolyte, right? It will be on every table with water. So it's liquid, right? So four to eight ounces of liquid, electrolyte, water, whatever you bring on your own. Um, because there are so many water tables, those of you who are especially walkers who bring your own water, um, you may not need to bring either as much water or any water at all, but we'll be going over that in, in just a few moments on how much liquid do you need per hour. And um, so... Here's an idea. Let me move this out of the way. Whoop. I hope you guys can see this. Um, anyway, um, we we all basically to figure out how much liquid, how much hydration you consume, you want to find out how much liquid hydration you sweat sweat off, right? Or you consume, you get rid of during the course of an hour, during the course of a run. And the answer is simple. Weigh yourself naked before and after every workout. Run, run, walk, or walk, right? Especially a day when we're, you're going long, like 19 miles this coming Saturday or 20 miles the Saturday after this, a week from now. Um, so weigh yourself, how much do you weigh? Write it down so you don't forget before and then weigh yourself again afterwards. And the difference of weight, if you weigh less, keep in mind each pound you lose, and you may not lose any, but we'll get to that in a moment. Um, each pound you lose is 16 ounces. So if you lose half a pound, you've just lost eight ounces of hydration. Now, you then have to add to that the amount of ounces that you took in during the workout. So this coming Saturday, with the table at the end and the eight other tables, whoops, let me put her down. Sorry, my assistant coach wanted to go down. Anyway, um, 
That was my dog, in case you're wondering. Um, the, so the, the amount, we are going to have about eight tables total, including the end table when you finish, on the 19 miles. Each table will have the same exact white cups. I got them from the LA Marathon. They are in the same pile as the, the cup pile used for the LA Marathon. So the white cups you see are the identical to the white cups being used. They're the same piles and piles of cups in the warehouse. That's where I got them today. Usually, tough to say, but usually volunteers pour about half a cup per table. So if you grab one cup, and by the way, pinch the cup, you know, so it makes a little kind of funnel like thing, and then dump it down your, it makes like a little V, I'm hoping you kind of see my hand sort of, makes a little V on the cup, and then pour it into your mouth as opposed to a big round cup that, you know, you'll get water up your nose and in your ears and all that. But Figure half a cup is about, uh, these are eight ounce cups, figure half a cup would be four ounces. So if you are running like a 10 minute per mile pace, just because 10 is a real simple one to figure, you got to calculate how many tables you're going to hit per hour. And if you're doing 10 minute per mile pace, you will hit six tables per hour right? So if you're hitting six tables per hour, it would be, and you're taking in half a cup of the eight ounce cups, and that means you're taking in half a cup would be four ounces of that eight ounce cup is usually about what they fill it to. Um, you're getting in four times six tables, that's 24 ounces uh, per hour, right? Um, on the LA Marathon. Um, this week, you know, Saturday, you're only getting a table every two miles. So, you know, your, your calculation will be fewer tables per hour, but you're, you're only adding in how much you took in to the amount of weight you lose to kind of calculate how much you need per hour. So this, now we're talking about the race. Now we're talking about the race itself. How do you calculate water tables per hour? Well, you know, if you're at a 12 minute per mile pace, I believe, if, tell me if my math is incorrect, you hit five tables per hour. I believe that's correct. And so at four ounces per table, five tables per hour, that would be five times four would be 20 ounces per hour. You would have the opportunity to take in if you got, you know, uh, five tables, if you were going 12 minute per hour pace and took in water at every table. Now, if you're going like 16 minute, 15 minute walker pace, um, you know, you're back there, you're with Jose, um, you may need to take water with you because you're only getting in like four, 15 minute per mile pace you walking, you would only be getting four, four tables per hour at four ounces per table. That's only about 16 ounces per hour. Now, if you're losing and consuming appropriately uh, more than 16 ounces per hour at 15 minute per mile pace, um, then you may be okay. You don't need to take any water with you. If you're consuming more than 16 ounces of water per hour and you're at 15 minute per hour pace, you may need to carry water with you. So I hope that kind of answers the question. Um, now, guy, men and women who are like doing a three hour marathon at, or let's make it simple on us, say you're going seven minute per mile pace, which is a little over three minutes, seven minute per mile pace, 
I don't even know what the math is on that, but you probably do it yourself. You probably don't need to stop at every water table and still get in enough hydration that you need to finish the LA Marathon. Maybe you'll do like two water tables and skip one and two water tables and skip one or something like that. Or maybe every other water table, do the math, figure that out for yourself. These are really important things to know and calculate before you go into starting line of the LA Marathon, because dehydration, and I'm gonna discuss this in a second, but dehydration can knock a lot, a couple percentage points of energy output just from a little dehydration. I've heard many different statistics. One statistic I've heard is, 2% dehydration, you lose 10% energy output. 3%, I've heard, you, you lose 15% or whatever it is. I, I've heard a lot of different numbers bandied about over the years, but no question, you do not want to allow yourself to become dehydrated. You don't want to get to a point where you're thirsty because thirst means you're dehydrated. Now, the other problem is, is you may get to a point where you're not even thirsty because you're not taking in enough sodium that's another lecture we'll we'll get to um but start also thinking about you're going to need to take in sodium which is in electrolyte that's a great thing about electrolyte there is sodium in there there is sodium in the goo that you take in um i don't have a goo packet with me but at any rate we, we will discuss that at at the next lecture but be prepared to start thinking about sodium intake and mineral intake, um, as well as carbohydrate, which we discussed in the last lecture, and now hydration that we're discussing now. Um, if you're not feeling thirsty and you've got a couple water tables, you may be just really low in sodium. You need you you may be on the road or in the road to what we call a hyponatremia, which is basically sodium depletion. You need sodium to absorb hydration. And if you don't have enough salt, sodium in your system, um, you're not gonna feel thirsty. Um, take in a bunch of salt and you'll want water right away. I guarantee it. <laughs> um, I'm not recommending you take in sodium by like downing a salt packet. That would be like the wrong way to do it. That's another discussion. Okay, so I think we've covered um, covered this topic pretty well. Um, oh, like I mentioned earlier, there are 24 water and electrolyte tables on the course. Um, excuse me. Then there's the finish line, of course, where you'll get another water bottle and you'll get an electrolyte bottle. So I'm not calculating the finish line hydration into those 24 water tables. It looks like on the map that I'm seeing, if you go to lamarathon.com, click on events on the top left, and then scroll, click on LA Marathon and scroll way down that page, you'll find the map and it'll have all the little electrolyte stations electrolyte stations and water stations. Um, and it looks like mile one, there is no water table. And it looks like mile four and five have a water table kind of in between there, which is I gather how they have 24 water tables and electrolyte tables as opposed to 26. Well, it's really 25 if you calculate the finish line. It sounds like that's how we, they alleviated one table. I'm not completely sure of that. That's just, take a look online, tell me what you think. Um, so with that, um, I know that's really complicated. Please feel free to ask questions. I'm gonna keep the recording going. Um, I always like to end with this, train smart, which we're talking about, train smart and train to win. Cause if you don't, you won't. And if you do, you just might win that is. And with that, I thank you, and I will see you all at the finish line. And now let's get rid of this and answer some of your questions that you might have uh, about all of that. Um, hang on, let me stop sharing. There we go. And, uh, there we go. Okay. You try for. <laughs> what? What's that? 
Oh, okay. Anyway, if you have a um, if you have a question, please type it in the chat thing. I think I have three. Where's the chat bar? There we go. Um, how does goo play into hydration? You know, that's a good question, but there's really not a lot of liquid in goo. I have never heard a lecture, a discussion where they added goo to hydration intake. And consequently, you know, when you take in goo, you may actually need to take in liquid to, to help swallow it, to help dissolve it. You know, goo, if you squeeze goo into a water glass of water, it kind of floats around for a while and you, you kind of have to mix it up a little. Obviously, your, your stomach does that. Your stomach is a really good mixing machine. But you may want to take in a little water with your gel to help swallow it. So I don't know that that goo really has enough hydration liquid in it to really significantly count into the hydration plan. Um, which brings would you, up, oh. would you say it's would you say it's necessary? Uh, goo or 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 carbohydrate goo. intake? Goo, goo yeah. during the marathon. I would say absolutely carbohydrate intake. You need that 40 to 60 grams per hour. And goo will give you about 23, 24, somewhere around there, depending on the flavor you get. Um, so yeah, so that's there's about 23 grams per, per hour if you take one gel per hour. If you take um, those uh, blocks or you know the little cubes or squares that all these different companies make generally speaking three of those equal one gel so you know people will tell me well i took in one block per hour well that may only be like seven grams per hour but you need 40 to 60 and they were wondering why they burned out and hit the wall you, you see what i'm saying they, they were totally depleted in carbohydrate um, the other end, you don't want to take in too much more than 60 because then you'll start taking in too much. Imagine too much carbohydrate, like eating a box of cookies, you know, in a couple minutes, you start getting stomach ache and nauseous. And it would be the same thing if you started taking in too many carbohydrate in any form. Um, and so you're saying uh, that we have to pack this stuff with us. So we're, we're technically eating as we're running. Yeah, basically. I mean, if you do goo, there will be two stations on, uh, uh, and, and this was my last lecture that I went into this long, oh, okay. pretty long involved discussion, but um, there will be two stations, you know, where they will have people with boxes of goo, and they will be handing them out as best they can. And as you're running or run walking or walking, if if you are capable of grabbing one without dropping it, um, or you can always slow down and they will hand you one. Um, there, there are two stations where they will give you a goo. Um, I don't know what, you know, you can't really tell what flavor they're going to hand you, you know. Um, at mile, I believe it's mile 12 and 18. Um, usually that it's something like that on the course. But beyond that, that's only two. Uh, and, you know, depending on how long you're going, calculate that 40 to 60 grams per hour and also calculate an electrolyte, which also has carbohydrate, which will be at every water table and figure every water table. If you do electrolyte with half a cup of electrolyte, maybe you're only getting like two grams per cup. And like I said, if you're going at 10 minute per mile, you got to calculate these, so how many water tables you're doing per hour. If you're doing only electrolyte, you may want to, you may need to do water and electrolyte, do the math, but figure two grams of elect carbs from electrolyte per table per mile um, on a, and a four ounces of an eight ounce cup. You know, they fill them up about halfway. So there's two more grams a carbohydrate. So if you're hitting 10 minute per mile pace at six tables per hour, two times six, there's 12 more. If you're doing 23 grams in a gel plus 12, that's 35. Uh, so if you do a gel every 45 minutes, you're in the ball game. And an electrolyte 
uh, drink a cup, half a cup, one of those white eight ounce cups, and they, they pour half of it as electrolyte. Um, and you do that every water table, there's your, you're in the ball game. If you're slower than that, you know, you may need to take in uh, either more gels or what I do, I have always done this because uh, I, I can't do Gatorade. I'm very open about this on races that have Gatorade, can't do it. So I get, you know, bad stomach. I get uh, abdominal distress, they call it. Uh, I get jittery, can't do it. So what I do is I have a fuel belt with these seven ounce bottles and I'll fill them with the appropriate amount of powder. Um, what I really will do is, you know, I'll, I'll take a 28 ounce bike bottle. I'll fill it with the scoops that I need in a 24 ounce bike bottle because I know how much that is. And then I'll pour a fourth of that into each of the four of my little seven ounce bottles. And um, I'll just keep the, the, the fuel belt bottles in my fuel belt. There are four of them, two in the front, two in the back. And with every quarter of the marathon, and pardon me, I'll take out one and I'll hold the cap in my my middle finger and forefinger and and the bottle in my other thumb and forefinger. And I pour in water and then I put the cap back on and I put it back in my belt. And as I, I run, I'm shaking it up. And I'll take one bottle every quarter of the marathon. I'll start with mile one, I'll fill it. Mile, the halfway, mile six, I'll fill it. Halfway point, mile 20. And then that'll, that, that will take me to the finish line. Uh, but I'll also take in gels. Um, I'll do gel every 45 minutes or so, maybe 40 minutes or so. Um, and that's how I got through marathons that had Gatorade where I couldn't do the product. And I'll also have water every mile um every mile of the marathon every water table i will i will grab water even with the the, the drink of my fuel belts that's how I, I would get through a marathon that's me that's my pace um you you kind of need to do the math yourself how much sweat are you uh are you losing uh, based on weight that's 16 ounces per pound you know, weigh yourself before and after. If you've lost a pound, that's 16 ounces you've just lost. And then add all those drinks that you take in during the course of the run on Saturday and uh, add that, the amount of ounces you drank um, on the run for the 19 miles to the amount of weight loss, if any. Um, uh, somebody, a pace leader asked me this earlier, if you're not losing any weight during the course of all these workouts, um, are you taking in enough hydration? And the answer would be, yeah. But how much hydration is that? Do that on the marathon. You know, you need to kind of figure that out. So hopefully that'll, that, that's, and hopefully you are taking in enough hydration during our training runs um, and not losing like a pound of weight. Um, so there you go. Um, hopefully I answered, did I answer that question? I, I will assume yes. Otherwise, please ask again or whatever. Uh, Lanny, okay, yes, Becky. Oh, Becky sends her love to everyone. Big heart. Thank you, Becky. How does goo play into hydration? Oh, I answered that one. Uh, George, will we ever get the end finish line in Santa Monica ever again? I prefer going down hill toward the end. George, they're working on it. Um, the problem is uh, Santa Monica. Um, and it's very, they're very, I think they're very open about it. Um, Santa Monica, Monica wants more, way more money um, for what is it like three and a half, four miles of the course. And um you know, it's, 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 uh, about negotiation. Um, I, I, I can't tell you the answer to that right now. There really is no answer to that at all. Um, on the other hand, they are building a subway in Century City, which is a plus, but that's another story. That's why we can't do the finish line where it is. That's what they announced today. Um, if the day of the marathon is say 80 plus, 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 
Fahrenheit at the finish line? What should one do about pacing? And Philip, that is a great question. And I have always said, when the heat goes up, the pace goes down. Meaning when it's hot out, you need to slow it down. Um, absolutely, because here's what it is. Think of your body similar to the radiator in your car, right? When it's hot, except the radiator, the fuel pump in your car will take hot water from the engine and it'll take that heat in liquid form from the engine to the radiator and the radiator gets air blown on it and that water will cool off a little and then that cooler water will go back to the engine to help cool the engine, right? Same thing with your heart and your skin. The heart heats up, it's, 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 it takes heat from internal, right? Um, the liquid, meaning your blood, will carry that heat to your radiator, which is the, the epidermal layer of your skin, your chest, your arms. We humans all over our body, we sweat. That sweat releases water. Your skin have pores. The, 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 um, the gases that you emit from your pores, um, the, the waste product gases like hydrogen, nitrogen, CO2, um, that you exhale and you release from your pores all have heat in it that you expel. Um, so all of that is way we get rid of our the heat inside our body. So when the heat goes up, your body gets warmer, obviously, um, and your heart, unlike the water pump of your car that is consistent, it can't speed up the water flow in your car, your heart will speed up the blood flow. We are more efficient than a car. The heart will speed up the blood flow because it wants to get rid of heat more efficiently, right? It wants to get that heat out of the epidermal, basically out of your skin, out of the pores of your skin, right? So it will pump harder to get rid of that heat. So basically when the heat goes up, your heart rate's going up. And that means when your heart goes up, that means you're using more and more glycogen. You know, remember the higher your heart rate, the more glycogen you use, right? The less fat you use, the more glycogen you use. So the closer you're gonna come to hitting the wall just cause it's hot out because your heart rate is beating harder to get that blood flow throwing, going through your system quicker to get the heat out of your skin, out of the, the epidermal layer of your skin, your, your pores, right? So absolutely, here's, here's a case in point. 2004 LA Marathon, uh, the, the heat went up to 84 degrees uh, before the finish line. And there were literally people sitting, I am told, I didn't see this, uh, there were literally people sitting on the side curb, just they had burned out from the heat. Um, there were even reports, um, excuse me, I'm sorry, it went up to 93 degrees at the finish line, 93 degrees at the finish line, 2004. There, there, there were people, a few people literally uh, reportedly uh, woke up inside someone's house because they had passed out on some neighbor, somebody's lawn, you know, just, and they woke up. People literally took people into their homes because they were so caring and decent and, and good natured. And it really, the LA population came out as positive people that we are um, by really helping get people water that day. This is 2004. Um, it was an amazing, uh, just uh, outpouring of humanity that day. But there were a lot of people who burned out. My, I was a pace leading the 930 group, which would have been a 410 finish time. And I said to everybody, the coach back then said, slow it down. It's going to be warm out there in the 80s. It ended up being 93. Um, and I said in my group, I said, you know, look, 
we're going to be 25 minutes slower than our goal anticipated pace. I'm sorry. There's just no way we're going to do better than that. There's no way we're going to do better than that. That was group five. Around mile 20, we, we passed a mob of group four walking together on the side of the road. We were running. Then about two miles later, we passed a broken up group three. A couple miles later, we passed, you know, bits and pieces of group two. And I'm told when I was really pushing it for the finish line with a good chunk of our group still intact, um, we passed some people from group one. And if you were a woman in group five that day, you were absolutely listed in the top. I think it was 500 people that get their names in the LA Times, uh, 500 women, 500 men. And um, we were in like the top something 5% of the LA Marathon that day because we slowed it down. Um, fuel for thought. Um, that's a great question. If it goes in the 80s, right, so it's freezing out there. Um, I'm wearing a winter coat. But um, if it's in the 80s, yeah, you, you, you need to slow it down for those reasons. Hopefully that, that made sense. You're going to sweat more. Um, your heart rate's going to be higher. You're going to need to take in more hard hydration, maybe even a little more carbohydrate per hour, um, all of those things. Of course, it'll be slower. Um, but at any rate, Okay. I prepaid parking, uh, Mar Marlene, I prepaid parking at Westfield Center, City Center, good. How far is that from the finish line? Is this parking lot accessible throughout the event or will be inaccessible at certain points and times due to road closures? Um, the Westfield City Center, I'm assuming you're talking about the Westfield Mall? Um, if it was um, one of the parking lots, if you went to lamarathon.com and you went to, you know, like race day information or whatever it is, um, uh, and went to where they have parking and you clicked on one of those parking things that said, I want to park in this building or whatever, um, they, and you got that rate and paid whatever it is, 25 bucks, I think is what, what they all are, um, then you are in a, a walkable, you know, building from the finish line. Um, the Westfield Mall, if that's the Westfield City Center, I'm not sure, I don't know, but all of them are walking distance. I, every year, um, if you have friends and family, here's a good tip. I, I do I do not do prepaid parking. I just, there, there's somebody at the mall. If you take, I come from the starting line. I come, I, I jump from Dodger Stadium. At, this is race day. This is what I've done every year, last couple of years. I will be there with you guys at the starting line. Um, I jump in my car, you know, where we all park our cars in Dodger Stadium. I go drive out Riverside Drive, or I guess it's Stadium Way to Riverside Drive. I get on the five freeway. I take the five, the 110 underneath where you guys run over the overpass. Um, you'll hear part honking below you. That's people like me driving past you. And uh, you take the 110, the 10 freeway. I get off at National take national to motor, motor over to um, Pico, Pico to Century Park East. Keep in mind Century Park West, that area is an, an avenue of the stars. That's about where our finish area is going to be. Those streets may be blocked off, but I've always been able to take Century Park East, excuse me, West, the westmost street in Century City, um, Century Park West, all the way in uh, to the mall. I drive right in the mall. There's a person taking money. I give them my debit card. Um, they take my debit card, 25 bucks. I'm in the mall. I park down below. My wife gets my car when she's done, and she drives that car home. 
my car is parked across the street with everything in it for with the awning and the water and the, for mile 18 right across the street. I park it there the night before. That's what I do. So if you have anybody that is uh, like dropping you off and wants to see you at the start line and wants to see you at the finish line, that's a great way to do it. Um, I pay that morning to get in the mall. Um, there are prepaid buildings that are like right across the street is one, a block away is another. Um, take a look. There's a map on the LAMarathon.com and you can get prepaid parking so you don't have to worry about it. Um, so there you go. Hopefully that answered the parking question. And yeah, all of those are within like a block of each other if you, if you paid for it online on the LAMarathon.com website. So there you go. And yeah, there are road closures in that area, like Santa Monica. You won't be able to enter from Santa Monica Boulevard because that Santa Monica Boulevard is going to close at like five in the morning. Um, you should know the buses in that area are up Avenue of the Stars across their south of Olympic Boulevard. So you will have, if you park in one of those buildings, prepaid parking or the mall, whatever, you will have a, got about a mile walk to cross Olympic. Um, it's kind of a bridge that goes over Olympic at Avenue of the Stars. Just walk down Avenue of the Stars. You'll see a mil million people going with you. And the other side of Olympic is where the buses pick you up and will take you to the freeway and take you to Dodger Stadium for free. Just show them your bib number and you're kind of good to go. So... Um, or like I said, you could have somebody drop you at Dodger Stadium and then drive back to the finish line. Uh, my You Can Goo has 15 grams. The directions say take every 45, 60 minutes. Well, that's great, you know, um, but 15 grams per hour, or if you do 15 divided by three would be five. If you took in, what is that? 20, if you took in one every 45 minutes, that would be like 20 grams per carbohydrate per hour, if my math serves me correct. You're about halfway to what you need. Um, there, UCAN is probably including, now I think UCAN may have, um, now you're talking about UCAN drink. There's UCAN drink. Oh, UCAN does make a gel, I think. Um, I'm surprised that gel is only 15 grams. I assume, knowing you can, they're probably assuming you will also take in a liquid. And if you want to, you can is perfectly a good powder. You know, you could do what I do with the powdered you can in my fuel belt. Um, and you'll get in way more carbohydrate through the liquid or do electrolyte, which so far I find everyone seems to love, which is shocking. Um, but everyone seems to love electrolyte. You, you take that in, in addition to your, 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 I guess, every 45 minutes of, of the gel from UCAN product. I'm not really familiar with that product, but um, every 45 minutes, I'd give you about 20 grams, I think, if my math serves me correctly. But you're going to need more than that. Um, there you go. Um, do it's about math. I'm assuming you can, which is a huge drink product. They make a powder. I'm assuming they they are assuming you will be drinking their drink all as you go, as well as the gels. I I don't know. Um, I, that's a, just a really good assumption. Uh, Roberta, how about pre-race hydration in days leading up to the race day? Don't want to overdo it, but want to be set up for success. Um, well, this goes into our next lecture, which will also include sodium because, um, yeah, you know, you don't want to go crazy with hydration. You do want to hydrate um, to uh, uh, an appropriate level, shall we say. Um, you know, this old adage of eight ounce, eight cups of eight ounces every day for some people it's too much, for some people it's not enough. Um, you know, um, you need to kind of calculate how much hydration you need per day. And there are actually questionable 
um, calculators that'll help you calculate how much hydration based on weight, how much you weigh, uh, will calculate how much hydration you need to take in per day. I'm not convinced that these little algorithms that they, they have online that you can find are very accurate. I think it's kind of more like you get to a point, you know how much hydration you need to take in before you're just, you know, urinating it out or um, like crazy or you're feeling thirsty. Um, that also has to do again with how much sodium you take in. If you're drinking way too much um, and you're just going to the bathroom all the time, you're also depleting minerals that you need for neurological function like sodium, potassium, those are the two major ones, calcium to some small degree. Um, but you also need sodium again, uh, that you'll be uh, urinating out. Um, you need sodium as, as well to absorb hydration. Um, you also lose sodium and potassium from sweating. So you, you need those, what we call electrolytes. Those are minerals that your body uses for neurological function. And like I said, sodium for absorbing hydration. Um, so you don't wanna take in too much hydration days before because that will flush some of those minerals out of your system. Uh, on the other hand, you can always take in a mineral pill. On the other hand, you don't wanna take in too much sodium before a race because you wanna be able to sleep and sodium can raise your blood pressure. And if your blood pressure is higher before you're going to sleep, you may not be able to get to sleep early uh, uh, as easily. And we all know eight to nine hours of sleep is optimal for us endurance athletes. So there are all these things to weigh into the balance. Don't just start going crazy, guzzling down gallons of water and urinating it all out. Um, you know, there, there are all these things to weigh into the balance here. Um, uh, that, that, that's a long lecture in and of itself, but there you go. Uh, Paul, great lecture, Coach. Thank you. Oh, Paul, thank you. Thanks, Coach David and everyone. Lolette, thank you. Uh, Glee 2016 marathon was hot too. Yeah, I've, I did not do LA in 2016. I think I, I know. I was on the side and at the finish line, uh, but yeah, that that one was um, that was a hot day as well. I don't think that one got up into the 80s or maybe it was lower 80s. Um, I don't recall. Certainly upper 70s. I remember people complaining it was warm. Uh, there was one year that poured rain the entire race. God, Lanny, I remember that one. That would have been 2010 or 11. I think 2011, very cold, pouring rain. I was standing on the side of the road. I was at the finish line. We, I had athletes that were running that year and I wore a raincoat and like six to eight layers of shirts and jackets. And I was absolutely soaked through. Um, I remember that very well. Um, that was awful. Lindsay, heat equals walk. Yeah, all Bob, I, all Bob and I, we we were all okay. Oh yeah, um, when you're walking, you do heat up. When you're running, you do heat up. There's no question. Our bodies absolutely uh, increase heat uh, from moving. We we are um, we use fuel. We use the resources, fat and carbohydrate gets turned into fuel, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, three phosphate molecules, one, and this is how the fuel we use works. ATP, adenosine triphosphate is fuel. Um, one phosphate molecule will break away from the other two, an electron will fire out, and these smallest submicroscopic portions of our muscle called the sarcomere, which is actually six little filaments, uh, strands of protein, beads of protein molecules, one strand of a bead, you know, a strand of protein molecules. That's how small it is. It's just one protein molecule after another makes up one of these strands. And six of these kind of look like this, 
when that electron explodes out, these it's kind of a ratchet system and it will release. And that is the explosion. We have actually an atomic explosion. We break phosphate molecules to release our muscles. And that's how we, why we, we are warm creatures. Um, because we use this fuel that is an atomic particle breaking away from two other atomic particles, phosphate, you know, and an electron fires out. That's why we heat up. And the more you move, the more these things explode in your muscles. If we were clear or opaque skin, smoke colored skin, you would absolutely glow in the dark. There was no question you would glow in the dark from all these electrons firing off. If you ever saw, so we do heat up just naturally from walking or running or run walking. If you ever saw one of these ab machine commercials where they test heat sensor on your stomach and our ab sensor, has, our, our sensor shows our abs are, you know, you see more red on their sensor than the other ab machine or whatever it is. It's just these, these, uh, uh, particles firing off while this person is doing crunches on the ab machine or whatever. Um, so that's how uh, we humans function. We are atomic creatures. Uh, we would literally glow in the dark if we did not have, you know, clear, if we had a clear or opaque skin. Uh, Lillette, we love LA. Yes, I, I do too. Um, Philip, so if the pace leaders don't slow down, you use your best judgment, absolutely. Um, but if it's going to go up into the 80s and 90s, especially, um, you know, you'll, you, I do a little announcement before we all leave, and I'll mention that. Um, listen, your breathing, your breathing is indicative of your heart rate. You might early on, it may be cool out, it may be 60 degrees when we start in the morning. Um, you might head out at race pace on that downhill early on right out of the stadium right down sunset when you hit sunset you're on kind of a slight downward decline for almost two miles until you hit the flat in chinatown um we'll go over that again or watch my 20 minute video already on youtube but um yeah, it depends. You know, it's not going to be hot usually when we start. It usually gets hot. But as I say, when the, the heat goes up, the pace needs to come down. And that's a very real thing. Um, yeah, if your pace leader doesn't slow down, um, slow down. Um, this is the great ethical debate that I have always had with being in charge of official pace leaders. And the question is, is do you finish on time knowing on a hot day you will burn everyone out and cause them to, to burn out and have a horrible race? Um, or do you not as a, you know, we are the official pace leaders of the LA Marathon. Um, we carry that sign. <clears throat> the sign has a finish time on it. It is nothing else but a finish time. Those were the signs that we will be carrying. Um, not like our training signs that have all this little information on it, the group number and none of that. It's just finish time. Do we finish on time, the time our sign says, or do ethically, knowing that that will burn out all the people in our group or our finish time, or do we finish at a reasonable time and come in late? And ethically, I do have to say it is a debate. I do have to say, as the person in charge, I have to make that ethical judgment. I think it's better to come in late on a 90 degree, even an upper 80, lower 80s, eh, play it by ear, maybe a minute too slower, but um, upper 80s, lower 90s or hotter, I think it's, it's important for our official pace leaders to come in behind schedule um, and do it appropriate, run the race appropriately to get those people around them to the finish line at the best possible time they can that year. You know, if there are strong headwinds, heat headwinds, heat hills and headwinds, those are the three hill H's from hell for us 
us runners, heat, hills, headwinds, all of which you need to slow down on. Now with the hills, um, you'll, you'll hear me talking about hills incessantly on those lectures that are already on YouTube, um, especially the first six miles, which we will be doing two, three Saturdays from now from the starting line of Dodger Stadium. We will be at Dodger Stadium three Saturdays from now, seven o'clock, running the first six miles. Um, you will hear me talk about those hills on Third Street, First Street, and Temple. And even right around the corner from the starting line, you're going up a hill to get out of the stadium for a third of a mile. Um, those hills we need to slow down on and we can make it up later. But, um, and all your pace leaders do have pace charts that kind of give ideas of how to do this. Um, but yeah, uh, if it's heat, hills, headwinds, you need to slow it down. It's all about glycogen consumption. Um, all three of those things, heat, hills, headwinds, are going to raise your heart rate and your glycogen consumption is gonna be high, uh, consumed quicker, and you're gonna come closer to hitting the wall from just using too much glycogen. Think about it. If you're running up a hill really hard or at race pace, uh, what's gonna to happen to your heart rate? It's gonna through the sky and your glycogen consumption is gonna start being depleted rapidly from running too fast up that hill. So just, just a matter of science, same thing that with the heat I already talked about and headwinds, the same thing. If you're running into a headwind, it's like running up a hill. It's more force against you. That's going to slow you down. That's going to raise your heart rate um, and start depleting your glycogen reservoirs too quickly. Hopefully this isn't too complicated, but yeah, absolutely. Pace leaders need heat hills, headwinds, slow it down. Um, Lindsay, 2014, my walkers finished 526 exactly on pace. Yeah, walk. <laughs> we passed a lot of our running groups who did not slow down. There you go. Um, yeah, you, you need to slow down. And walkers, um, actually, it, this is an interesting thing. Walkers train theoretically faster than their marathon pace. So yeah, you guys on the marathon are going slower than what you train at theoretically, or hopefully. So yeah, uh, I could see why that would work. Um, I could see why that would work really, really well. So if it's like a 90 degree day, go with Lindsay, you'll finish at five and 26 or five and a half hours or whatever um, she's doing that day. Uh, I forgot her exact finish time. But um, yeah, you know, um, of course you're using different muscles so you may not be able to go as fast as John or Lindsay or walk one or two groups, but that's a whole other story. Oh, Westfield, yes, Marlene says, Westfield Century City Center is at $33 now. Okay, they've raised the price, 33 bucks, okay. Um, so yeah, you're, you're, um, there you go. Uh, Lindsay, a lot are 33 from the official marathon site. Oh, I guess they've raised them all to $33. Um, thank you for telling me that. I, I really didn't look at that this year over last year. Um, I guess getting in this, parking your car in Century City is now 33 bucks. Um, so, um, there you go. Uh, Galit, hydration includes amino. Oh, wait, I can't read all of this. Whoops. Here we go. I have the you can combination. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, hydration includes amino when you're, I guess, when you're doing you can, I guess it means you do, you can drink and you can gel um, all together that combination will get you there. That makes sense. There you go. And there are some amino acids, I gather, in the the probably the drink or the gel or both. I'm not sure. Um, okay. Um, science is a little out on protein. Amino acids, you know, all these different amino acids make up proteins. And um, protein takes up, makes several, needs several amino acids to be protein. Okay. Um, there's no real science as to whether um, protein will help you during 
a run or a race. Um, there is absolute science and makes perfect sense why protein, amino acids, after a race, you know, you want to rebuild muscle tissue. All these little filaments are 100% protein. They break up. You want to rebuild protein. You take in protein. Uh, that makes total sense. So right after you finish taking in protein in any form, liquid, whatever, a bar, a protein, whatever it is, taking in protein right after a race is absolutely critical to, to recovery. Um, absolutely true. During the race, there is theory that it might help during the race, um, but there's no real science to say, yes, it does. So there's no science saying it's bad taking in protein during a run, run, walk, or walk, but there's no real science that I have found to say that it will help you. There are drinks um, I'm assuming like you can like accelerate like some other drinks that are on the market that do have like a four to one ratio of four grams of carbohydrate per one gram of protein. And they claim that this helps you during the race. Certainly they, there are reasonable claims to say it does help you after the race, but during the race, I haven't really seen the hardcore science like after the race with protein. So that's when you talk about amino acids. Uh, we don't know. I don't know. Will it hurt you? Uh, probably not, unless you're sensitive, your stomach is sensitive, and that's a very individual thing um, to taking in protein during a race. Possible. That's a very individual thing. Uh, 2011, what, there you go, Lindsay, 2011 was the rain, cold, monsoon. I was standing at the finish line. It looked like a CNN refugee camp leaving the finish line. It looked just like what you see on television, on CNN, when a bunch of refugees are leaving a war zone. That's what the finish line looked like. It was just all these people huddled together with, with blankets, walking past the finish zone. Oh, it was just awful. Um, any tips on returning to running after an injury? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, send me, Tanya, send me an email to davidl at mccourtfoundation.org, not com, but dot org. Um, also, the, there is on our, from a few weeks ago, there is a lecture on that very topic on our YouTube channel. So go to YouTube, search for LA Roadrunners, and look for our newest logo, um, the navy blue with our newest, you know, this logo, um, and you will find that lecture on, uh, on uh, uh, re returning after an injury. Um, or recovery, I think it's maybe it's labeled something like that, but um, it's a rather involved lecture. And send me an email; we can figure out together where you need to jump back to, how much you lost. You lost two weeks. Theoretically, you could probably jump in last week and start in right from there. Um, you know, you may not want to go the full 19 miles. Um, depending on your last long run. We are doing out and back two miles, then out and back another two miles. Then we're going to the finish line of the LA Marathon. That's our course for this Saturday. So you may want to skip the first two out and back miles <clears throat> and jump in with them on the next two and the rest of it. Um, uh, just that would give you 17 miles, which might be where you left off, just to you don't want to risk injury. And you could start on this coming Monday, on Monday, uh, last week. Um, oh, excuse me. That will be this week. You would start in Monday this week for next Monday because you lost two weeks of running. That, that would pretty much answer your question. But um, send me an email with any additional details. Did you miss days before that? What was your injury? Let's try and figure out how to keep you from getting that injury again. Um, there are all sorts of questions that I have individually to you, Tanya, 
and let's figure it out. So you, you won't have to deal with that on a long run and get re-injured before the marathon. Um, Mariana, oh, yeah, I'm yawning, I'm sorry. Mariana, highly recommend the lectures on how to pace LAM, LA Marathon. It's worth every minute. Thanks for sharing all your knowledge, Coach. Uh, God, thank you, Mariana, for saying that. Um, I, I broke them up in, the, there was one long lecture that I gave. It was an, about an hour, 57 minutes total. I broke them up into three different lectures, an A, B, and a C. Again, you'll find them on our YouTube channel. They're up there now. And I will be posting links to those probably this weekend or something, sometime soon, uh, just on our Facebook channel. So you see the link to the, you know, you'll do it. Um, kind of boring because it's just me talking. Although you do see the, the all sorts of charts and maps and all sorts of, you, you, I shared all sorts of stuff. So that's all in there. Pacing six hours this year, faster go with John at 5.45. Um, oh, Lindsay, you are pace leading walk two this year. The fastest walk one group with John is 5.45. I have that on my spreadsheet. I just don't have that up. I'm not looking at it, but there you go. So walkers, John, 5.45. And Lindsay, six hours, if you can keep up with them walking or you can jog a little. And I, I confess, I've tried to walk with Lindsay. I can't do it. I, I cannot walk that fast. You have to engage all sorts of, for me, dormant walking muscles that I, I can't walk as fast as she can walk. Um, there is great reality that. Opinion, Lanny, opinion on taking a modium. I don't even remember what a modium is. Is that that's a, like a laxative or something? Um, I really have to look that one up. I, I'm really, I have no clue. Um, I'd have to look that one up. I apologize. Um, I am not sure. I, I don't know if that to help with energy or anything like that. Um, I'm not even sure what Imodium is. I thought it was like a laxative or something. I'm not even sure. Um, I will I, I will look that one up. I'm curious. Uh, Tanya, thank you. Will do. Oh, with a smiley face. Tanya, thank you. Mar Marlene, always excellent advice and information each session. I am glad I sign up with LARR. Thanks a lot, Coach. God, Marlene, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate that. Um, Lan Lanny, it's uh, uh, anti-diarrhea. Oh, well, there you go. Um, you know, I don't know if that's also a diuretic, anti-diarrhea. Um, there are a lot of people, I, I, you know, if you can do without those things, I really have no idea. Um, if you can do without those things, obviously you don't want diarrhea. There are people, I find about 5% of the population um, that cannot take in just about anything or they get severe abdominal distress or diarrhea or both. Um, it's, a, you know, like I said, about 5% is what I'm reading, what my vision is, my empirical view of this is. Um, it's not a lot of people, but it's severe. It's really serious. And there are a lot of you out there and may, that make up that, what, about 5%. Um, you know, 26,000 people, 5% of that do the math. There are a lot of you. Um, if you can find things to eat beforehand that will not, it's really trial and error. If you can find something that you can eat where you won't get that diarrhea, where you won't need that emodium. Um, I don't know anything about emodium, positive or negative. I'm only thinking if there's something that you can do to not get that um, diarrhea where you need emodium. Um, pardon me, good grief. I need more sleep. Um, find that food. And by trial and error, it's going to take an awful lot. Um, and it may be a food that makes no sense, but try everything. 
And uh, obviously fried foods you can eliminate, um, you know, bacon, eggs, cheeseburgers, you know, you can eliminate all that junk, you know, but um, try anything you can get your hands on, real fruit. I recommend trying baby food because it's just mulched fruit, you know, like applesauce is baby food, you know. Um, anything you can find that will keep you from needing Imodium, having that diarrhea in advance. And I do thank you for sharing. I really appreciate it. This is not a topic people really enjoy sharing, um, but it is an important topic. Um, please, uh, you know, try it. Um, I, I will have to look up Imodium and, and what it does beyond. I, I, I think it might be a diuretic, which would not be good. I mean, obviously, if you need it, you need it, but try and get to a point with food intake where you don't need it pre-race or during the race. Um, I would think I would think it would be a diuretic of some type as well. Um, Imodium. Maybe somebody can look that up on YouTube. Is that a diuretic? Obviously, um, you don't want a diuretic. You don't want to be dehydrated. You want to be fully hydrated. Hence the question earlier, do we drink a lot before the week leading up to the race? The answer is, well, sort of within reason, you know, um, and hydration is important, obviously, hence our discussion tonight. Um, so let's see if Imodium is not a diuretic. Alcohol is a diuretic. Please, please, like two weeks before the LA Marathon, no alcohol. I know this is a big topic for us, and I'm going to kind of roll out this problem right now. Um, we always, as roadrunners, we always used to go to El Cholo, which is on, a lit, on, on Wilshire and 11th. El Cholo restaurant, great place. I love it. We would do this Friday before the marathon, and everyone would have a drink. We wouldn't get drunk, but we'd have a drink. But that was like four days before the LA Marathon. You're now dehydrating your body with alcohol. And I'm thinking, you know, I can't as a coach recommend we go to El Cholo as fun and enjoyable as that was, unless everybody's not going to drink. And we always met at the bar. So it was the idea that we would all drink. You don't want to drink alcohol within, a, you know, 10 days. It, take, it can take over 10 days to rid your body of alcohol um, before a race. So you don't want any alcohol. It's a diuretic. You don't want to start your race dehydrated. You don't want alcohol. It's a diet. Dehydrate you. So beware of alcohol and people who want to party before the marathon. I cannot recommend El Cholo, even though it was so much fun. I love doing, maybe we'll do it two weeks before. Um, maybe that's the time to do it. Um, that That's one we're gonna, that's the big question of the day. We're gonna have to roll out and figure out what we're gonna do. Cause that was a tradition, you know, we, we always did that. Um, uh, Marlena, always excellent advice and information each week. I am glad I, oh, there, I already read that. Uh, Anti-diarrhea, yeah, uh, Lenny, good, okay. Uh, thank you, David, for your lecture. George, thank you, uh, thanks for chiming in. I don't have any more in the chat uh, bar. Does anyone have any, like I said, you can always scroll your cursor across the screen and uh, and click on the mute button and then you can, you can talk. Does anybody, boy, that's bright, what the heck? Uh, let's get, whoops. There we go. I should have done this like a half hour ago. <laughs> there we go. It's a little better. All right. Anyway, oh, uh, there we go. Okay. Um, well, there you go. Does anybody have any more questions, either verbal or in the chat box? Uh, oh, there will be Hash House Harriers on course with beer and more. Pass and have after the finish. I absolutely, I remember hearing a guy who on the Chicago Marathon at mile 20, somebody gave him a shot. There's a bar that you run right by and somebody handed him a friend, handed him a shot of whiskey. 
And he, what the hell? He didn't know. He took the shot of whiskey and then bam, it was just hit him like a lead weight. Now this is while during the marathon. Um, and he so regretted that the rest of the race. It just, um, and here again, these very, very well-meaning, there's a running club called Hash House Carriers. They're international. There is one in Los Angeles. They're well-meaning. They have little cups of beer. They come out around mile 20 every year. And they're very cool. They, they spend their own money to give people a beer. The idea is you, you reduce your pain and suffering or whatever by numbing your body. But it's a diuretic. It's, it's alcohol. It's absolutely true. I'm not even sure you want the beer with alcohol in it at the finish line. I believe similar to the Rose Bowl half, they may. I'm pretty sure that you can get a free thing of non-alcoholic beer, which would actually be a good thing, non-alcoholic beer. But then again, you, you want to start hydrating no matter what you do, you're going to be a little dehydrated by the end of the marathon. It's just a matter of life. Um, you do want to start hydrating, taking in sodium, minerals, all that. Um, I would kind of wait till you get to a restaurant after you've eaten something. You know, I love for me, this is me, uh, tomatoes have a lot of sodium in it. So a burrito covered, smothered with tomato sauce and, you know, whatever chili stuff. Uh, to me, that's my go-to finish, you know, food because it's got a lot of sodium and protein in it, whatever. I usually just do beans and rice because I'm a vegan, but, you know, throw in some chicken or meat or whatever. That's my go-to. Um, and then you can have a beer and you can have a drink and, you know, then it doesn't matter. But yeah, I absolutely pass up the Hash House Harriers. They're wonderful people. They mean well. But yeah, I can't recommend alcohol during the race. That's even worse. Uh, any other questions or or uh, chats or statements or anything? Uh, we're still recording. Um, I'll turn off the recording in just a minute. Uh, and then you can swear in whatever you want to do. But uh, any other questions? Going once, going twice. Okay, with that, do I hear a question? Maybe not. Okay, with that. I am going to turn off the recording. You will hear a little voice saying the recording is now ended. I'm going to stop the recording. And if any of you live uh, have a question, please stay on. I'll answer more questions. For those of you watching the, li the, the recording of this on our YouTube channel from the link on our Facebook site, which I'll post that link uh, after the recording is done and I can post it, um, and I've uploaded it to YouTube. Uh, for those of you watching the recording, thank you for watching, and uh, we'll see you next week, and we'll do it again, and we'll talk about minerals. Take care, you guys. Bye.